can't say this in a while, but didn't God make a beautiful day out this morning? Amen. Sun shining, light breeze. So let's just praise God this morning as we're here and just give him everything we have. So let's all stand on this first song as we praise and worship this morning. each other later in the service. Well, good morning, everybody. It is exciting to see everybody out this morning. I am so happy to be here. Boy, let me tell you what, I'm on fire today. God has lit a fire underneath me, in me, and through me. And uh, I cannot wait to share what the message he has given me this morning to, to you guys. And uh, so I am going to give you some announcements, and, and we'll get going here. So thank you to all who participated in the Red Cross uh, blood drive this past week. They collected 45 units, which exceeded their goal. God bless you for giving to the gift of life. Yes. Tuesday is the first Tuesday of the month. What do we do? Pray. We pray for Branch County. Branch County. That's right. We pray for Branch County. Uh, see the prayer uh, prompts on the bulletin insert. We have 18 prayer watchmen. We need some more people to pray. Who's going to take, who's going to take up the cross and pray for Branch County and all of our families in Branch County? All right. Well, fantastic. You want, you want to sign up for prayer? See us afterwards, okay? September 4th, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We have been anticipating this like no other. Uh, we will begin... Our new Wednesday night service, just like a Sunday morning service, we will have worship, we will have prayer, a lesson, and using the Bible study in the book, of experiencing the heart of God. If you don't have a book, we still have books left, right? 
See Jenny over here. They're 10 bucks. We greatly appreciate it. You guys are going to be so blessed when you go through this book. You are going to be ex extremely blessed when you come in and be a part of the Wednesday night service. We are excited. We have been anticipating this for months. And uh, God is going to do some great things here at the, at the Northview Christian Church. So pick up your copy of the book in the lobby. Uh, ten, ten bucks, we, or ten bucks, it doesn't matter. If you want to pay a buck a week, we'll take it. You pay 50 cents every two, however you want to pay for it, we'll, we'll take it. But you are going to be extremely blessed. So please insert the service into your schedule if at all possible. We will meet in the fellowship hall. I believe we're going to be meeting right here. Okay? But either which way, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, be here. Next Sunday, September 8th, at 2, uh, September 8th, is our bilingual combined services is next Sunday. And uh, we're going to have a potluck lunch immediately following. If you want to be blessed, come to the service next Sunday. Bring some folks with you because it's going to be exciting. We're going to have our uh, bilingual service with our Hispanic church going on, our Latino services and our services together, you, uh, this is going to be a great, great service. Don't miss out. On Monday, September 9th, the steak and shrimp dinner for men at the LJCA is $18 and $12 for under 13. It starts at 515. Worship is, is, is at 7. Sign-up sheet is on the kiosk out in the center of the hallway out here. The standard devotionals for fall 2024 are here, and they are on the table out there. Grab one. How many have started that? You, uh, is it good stuff? Amen. You're missing out if you don't pick up one of those devotionals, okay? So please see your bulletin for other announcements and coming events. All righty. Thank you, Steve. If we could all stand this morning as we read God's word from the Bible. I believe today is out of Psalms, Psalm 29. So let's all read this together as a congregation this morning. Honor the Lord, you heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Let's continue this morning to worship the Lord and just give him all the glory that he deserves. Here I am to say that you're mine. 
am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. We're all together loving, all together worthy, all together You are my God. 
Chair. <laughs> Morning, everybody. I don't know why I always have to file aisle on these communion devotions. He does such a great job, and then I flounder. So, anyway, I'll try. Be reading this morning from. Uh, John 20, starting with verse 24, when Jesus appears to Thomas, doubting Thomas. Now, Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Uh, This weekend, Labor Day, we honor the working people. Uh, This devotion here is labeled, Show Me Thy Hands. A man's hands tell something about him. On this weekend, when we remember the working man, It is easy to identify someone who has labored for years out of doors. Just look at his hands. Honest hard work is good. Paul told the Ephesians that a Christian should no longer steal, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. That's in verse uh, Ephesians 4.28. 
the hands of Jesus also tell us something. As our scripture from John 20 indicates, Thomas saw in Christ's hands the positive identification of him as the Lord as we came about the table to remember what happened to his hands. We must also look at our own. The words of B.T. Badly cause us to search our hearts. Lord, when I am weary with toiling and bur burdensome seem thy commands, if my Lord should lead me to complaining, Lord, show me thy hands. Thy nail-pierced hands, thy cross-torn hands, my Savior, show me thy hands. Thy nail-pierced hands, thy cross-pierced hands, O oh God, dare I show thee my hands. Uh, we can tell some workers by looking at their hands. Doubting Thomas had no doubt when he saw Jesus' hands. He declared, my Lord and my God. In verse 29, then Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. And uh, we remember Jesus each week as we come around, as we gather around the table to partake of the emblems he left for us to never forget. Him, the bread we break to represent his broken body, the cup to represent his shed blood. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his love. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for all that he gave that we might have life. We also thank you for these emblems that he left for us to remember him by. Uh, I pray that we use these emblems in a worthy manner and in a way that's pleasing to you, in a way that everyone is able to remember Jesus and what he did. Amen. Amen. I will give everyone a minute or two to partake of your emblems on your own. And uh, thank him for all that he's done. Let's pray again. The Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. I thank you for the opportunity we have to freely gather here and worship thee and fellowship with like believers. I also would like to thank you for the tithes and offerings that everyone has brought to bring before the Lord to be used to, in your service, Lord. We cannot thank you enough for each and every one's contribution to this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In your bulletin, it lists the missions moment first but we've always done prayer time first, so I'm gonna revert back to that. As we took the uh, opportunity this morning to look around and, and look at our neighbor, we just want you to know that everyone here is being prayed for. And that we pray for our neighbors and for God's will. And also we can pray for our neighbors that we live next to. So shall we pray? Take a moment of silence.
Dear Lord, we just want to lift our neighbors up to you. Uh, we pray most of all that your will will be done in our lives and their lives, uh, no matter what they're going through, whether it's uh, joy or struggles. But we just pray for a peace that passes all understanding and that we know from the promise of your word that we can do all things through Christ. And so we lift up our neighbors, lift up our neighbors at home, and Lord, we just pray for opportunities that uh, we can be a witness to them, that the light of Christ can shine through our lives and to each other. And uh, Lord, we just pray for this church to be a beacon in this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our missions moment this morning is beginning Cares for Life. And if you remember the baby bottles that we filled last spring uh, as a fundraiser, and every year uh, Jane uh, Ford gives a report. But uh, in the pink sheet it says, all the services offered by Beginnings Care for Life are offered free of charge. Thousands have received help from this ministry and thousands still need it. These services only can be provided through the generous donations of ministry partners. Please pray that they will receive the funding necessary to continue to service the individuals and families in this community. And for more information and inspiring stories, they have the website here, beginningscare.com. And they have a very beautiful location uptown here. Uh, it's straight east of Century Bank and Trust, right across the street. Nice, nice building. And then I think Kathy Pike, one of our members here, is on their board of directors. Shall we pray for this mission? Dear Lord, we just thank you that as a church here that we can support uh, a mission for our community, that we can reach out helping families, uh, caring uh, for each other, uh, to have a Christ-centered home. We just pray for this mission to flourish and uh, being able to help uh, one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. No. Thank you, Brother Dave. Larry, for your uh, phenomenal uh, ent entry into uh, the um, um, what do I want to say? Communion. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I I was excited when I was offered the opportunity to come before you guys this morning, and uh, man, I was praying and praying and praying and praying that God would put a message on my heart that would resonate not only with me, but resonate with you, not only through the day but through the week and through the month and through the rest of the year and hopefully through the rest of your lives, you can take some of this with you as you walk this thing called life. Well, I'm going to open up in prayer and we're going to get going, okay? We love to pray in this church, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here today. God, I pray that you will be felt, your spirit will be felt here. God, my prayer is, is that people will come in, but they leave a whole lot different than, them, than what they came in. And God, I pray that you would work on our hearts, work on our minds, work in our spirit, so we can take this message out to those who don't have it. And God, we are in a battle. There's no two ways about it. We are in a battle. And I pray, God, that we pick up our armor we pick up our defensive weapons, our sword, and our shield, and Lord, we hit the streets. We hit our neighborhoods. We hit our cities, towns, state, and beyond with your message. Time's ticking, God, and you are counting on us to get your message out. And Lord, just fill our hearts this morning with the message that you have given us today 
and we thank you, and we praise you, and we glorify you, and everybody said amen. All right. I love to open up with a joke. Really? Yeah, I do. And here's, the opening, here's, here's my opening joke. A, a small church in the, hills of, in the foothills of West Virginia, everybody just got into the church. They were coming in, and all of a sudden, a lightning bolt strikes the church. The church starts on fire. And everybody cleared the church, except one elderly lady who sat in the middle. And when the smoke cleared, there was Satan. And Satan asked that little old lady, he asked her, aren't you afraid of me? Nope. She kept on reading her Bible. You're not going to run like the others? Nope. I said, why not? He said, I've been married to your brother for 30 years. In 1945, there were three big-time preachers who come out of the center stage. Chuck Templeton, Bron Clifford, and Billy Graham. Out of those three preachers, you may recognize a couple of them. Certainly, we all recognize Billy Graham. So why not the other two preachers? How come we don't recognize their names? Well, that's a good question. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I worked out hard on that question. Uh, all preachers above stated, again, come out on fire with, for God. Every single one of them came out at the same time. They're about the same age. And they come out on fire for God. All the preachers were filling huge stadiums, huge meeting places, every single one of them. And many people gave their hearts and lives over to Christ during that time. But just in a few five short years, Chuck Templeton left the ministry to pursue a career in radio and to be a, a television commentator, commentator and a newspaper columnist. In 1950, this post potential Babe Ruth of preachers wasn't even in the game no longer believed in the validity of the claims of Jesus Christ. A bit more about him later. That's a sad story, isn't it? Five years, five short years, the Babe Ruth, the preachers. But what about the other two? Another good question, you guys. Thank you for participating today. In 1954, Brian Clifford was ablaze with his knowledge of Jesus Christ. Brian Clifford was called the greatest preacher since the apostles. But something happened. Brian Clifford seemed to fall apart. Financial irresponsibility started to take hold of his life. His wife bore two children with Down syndrome. He left his wife. He left his ministry and got a job selling cars in Texas. Within 10 years of his glory days, as one of the nation's greatest evangelists, he died of cirrhosis of the liver. You see, he couldn't handle his life. And he turned to the bottle, and Ron Clifford was found dead in a scathing hotel in Texas. You see, he had become an alcoholic, and he lost all hope, all sense of God's touch on his life. His hopelessness, which had destroyed his liver, his ministry, his family, at the age of 35, was once great preacher brought him to an early grave in a, ho in a hotel room all by himself. Some pastors in Amarillo, Texas, took up an offering and among themselves to ship his body back east for a decent burial in a cemetery for the poor. Two of the leading lights of the body of Christ had flamed, they fizzled, and been extinguished within a decade. But Billy Graham, Billy Graham, Billy Graham stayed true to the course and true to his God. His, his, he wasn't as spectacular as the other two, but he proved a lot more durable, consistent in his Christian faith, 
and his Christian walk. Let me tell you a couple of good things about Billy Graham. I, you probably know, probably don't know. Listen, his integrity was second to none. Billy Graham, when he was, when he, uh, was invited to an to a event, he, was, he made some instructions to the person he was talking to. He said, do not send a female to pick me up. Not nothing against females. He loved females. So hey, I just want to make that clear. But because of his integrity, he would not be alone with another woman because he respected his wife that much and loved his wife that much and was dedicated to her that much. He did not want to have any appearance of sin whatsoever. And when he got to the hotel, his entourage, before he even walked into the hotel room, his entourage cleared the hotel room. They scoured the hotel room. They looked under the beds. They looked in the, in the uh, desk and things of that nature. They even took out the TV set. Because he did not want to leave one iota inch for the enemy to come in. He did not want his integrity challenged. That's what Billy Graham did and more. Well, he stayed true to the course and true to his God. He wasn't as, as spectacular as the other two. Just a reminder. But he stayed in his Christian walk and his Christian faith. It's been told that Templeton came to, a, to Billy of what would be their final conversation. And get this, he mocked the idea of literal creation story as found in Genesis. And he wanted to know how Billy could possibly believe it. Are you ready for his response? Oh, this is good stuff. Lean forward to get a listen. This is good stuff. Billy said, I believe in the Genesis account of creation because it's in the Bible. I've discovered something in my ministry. When I take the Bible literally, when I proclaim it as the word of God, my preaching has power. When I stand on the platform and say God says or the Bible says, the Holy Spirit uses me. There are results. Wiser men than you or I have been arguing questions like this for centuries. I don't have the time to, or intellect to examine all the ideas and all the sides of the theological dispute. So I have decided once and for all to stop questioning and accept the Bible as God's holy word. Folks, we need to do that. Regardless of what's going on in our life, we need to dig into God's word. We need to accept it as God's word and what it says. Dr. David, Dr. David Jeremiah has a saying that if God said it, I believe it, and it's the end, it, it settles it. Let me say that again. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Now, I think I told the story here not so long ago, but I'm going to retell it again. Uh, there was I, was, I lit up Facebook with a topic, a hot topic of the day. And man, I tell you what, there came all kinds of, all kinds of comments on that. And how dare you say that? And how dare you say this or that? God still loves and say, well, yep, beep, beep, he does. Flip side of the coin is, if it says it is wrong in the Bible, guess what? It's wrong. And, 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 and the final, I think it was about 60 or 65 comments on this topic. It came back. This guy just, you know, ripped me apart. And I said, if God's word says it, I believe it. And that settles it. Crickets. Nobody commented after that. How do you get out of an argument, out of a theological argument, and you're sitting there with a friend trying to tell them about Jesus, and they seem to know more about the topic than you do, but all in the wrong direction? I love having intellectual, intellectual com, or, uh, conversations with these people. 
And if I can't answer it and it looks like this guy is just not getting it, that's what I go to. That's your go-to. And let me tell you what, they have nowhere to stand on that. Because God's word said to believe it. Because of Billy Graham's conviction of God's word, our world has been incredibly blessed and countless multitudes have found eternal life through Jesus Christ because the man had stayed his course and true to his calling, true to his faith, and true to his God. When Billy Graham graduated from this life and passed from earth to heaven at the age of 99, his voice was nearly gone. His eyesight had failed, and his body was a mere shell of what it was, what it once was. But his faith, his faith in Jesus was still strong. Regardless of what was, what was going on in his body, his faith in Jesus was still strong. Unlike the other two evangelists, Billy had come to Christ in his youth and never de deviated from his devotion to his Savior. Billy had his armor on, his shield up, and his sword, which is the Word of God, ready to do battle at any and every moment. Are you hearing me today? In the Christian life, it's not how you start out, it's how you finish. Let me say that again. In the Christian life, it's not how you start out, it's how you finish. And Billy was a great example of that. The other two, not so much. But wait, 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 wait. Hold the phone, preacher. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea what I'm going through. No, I don't. God does. God does. Oh, God knows what you're going through. And when we're at the end of our rope, we got one or two choices. We can choose to go to the, to, to the bottle or to drugs or whatever, or we can choose to go to Jesus Christ. And he will, he will forgive you of your sin. And he will take you in his arms. And he will uplift your life. And he will make your life better if you give Jesus the chance. Corey Timboom, a lady who endured the pit of hell in German prison concentration camp in Auschwitz. And this is a sermon in itself. I love one of the quotes that she, that she had stated. Are you ready for this? There is no pit that is deep that the love of God doesn't go deeper. Whoo! What a statement. There's no pit so deep, no sin so deep, that God's love doesn't go deeper. You see, God's love is greater. It's greater than all of our sin. It's greater than all of our mistakes. It's greater than all of our shortcomings. Then it's even greater than the trials that we're going through. Regardless of all the above, God still loves us. If you don't believe that, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> or there's a whole lot of people in this room who can do that for you too. When life gets tough and when things get out of whack, you got to keep on going, you got to keep on believing, and you got to keep on marching, you got, you got to keep on reaching for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords' hand. You got to keep on doing. You know, the, the enemy would love no more than for us to fall down and give up. Yep. I told you, when you gave your heart and life to Christ here years ago or months ago, whatever it was. See, I told you, it wasn't going to work. See, you're still poor. You're still aching. You still have troubles. You're still divorced. 
<laughs> oh, boy. He loves to get us out of whack. We have an example in God's word. His name is David. In the Bible, who knows trouble, he knows defeat, and he knows his faith. Let me set this up. Take your Bibles and turn. I've got to go down there and get my Bible. Second Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Let me set this up for a minute. David had fell in love with one of his commander's wives while the commander was at war. And, by the way, he knew that his commander was on the field. And things got a little hot. And you want to read the you want to read the uh, rest of uh, up to up to uh, this chapter twelve to see what happened. But anyway, so here here he is. David fell in love, and there's one problem. Uriah is still at battle. So guess what? So David calls him back to battle. From battle, guess what happens? In between that, Bathsheba come back and says, I'm pregnant. And so David cooked up the scheme for Uriah to come back, and, but he didn't lay with his wife, you see. And he said, I can't be here because my men are out in the field. I can't do it. I said, I got to go back and battle. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But get this. David's scheme did not work out. And I could almost bet you 10 to 1 that he was very frustrated. Let's pick it up. Let's pick this up in verse, uh, let's see here, verse 1 through 13. 12, 1 through 13 says, you know you're old when you take off your glasses and you have to read. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there are two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, he grew it up, and with him, his children. It shared its food, drank from its cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, the, now a traveler come in to a rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal. For the traveler who had come to him, instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for one who had come to him. David, hearing this, burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb for four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. What did Nathan say? (laughs) David says, or Nathan says, you're the man. You're the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judea. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. So why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. 
Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took his wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you before your very eyes. I will take your wives and give them to who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Guess what? David was confronted with his sin. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David had come one-on-one with his sin. That's why I said there, when, when David knows trouble, David knows sin, David knows victory, and David knows faith. And the cool thing about it is, he kept on going. He didn't stop. He kept on going. He got up. He dusted his armor off. He, I could see him right now wiping down his sword, the word of God. And he had his shield up, dusted that off too. And he kept on going. And the Lord blessed him tremendously. He kept on going. Now let's take a look at David again. Turn with me, if you will, in Psalm 37, which was the opening. So, uh, there was some verses uh, in the opening scripture about that, and I appreciate that. Psalm 37. Again, we're starting at verse 1, 1 through 10. This is a wonderful psalm of David. A wonderful psalm of David. Verse 1 says, Do not fret because of those who are evil or envious of those who, are, who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. David says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. Take note. Are you ready? He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Amen. Look at this. Look in Psalms 37 again. We got some promises there, folks. We got some promises there. In Psalm 37, 3, what does it say? It says, trust in the Lord and do good. And we're going to dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you desires of your heart. In verse 5, it says, commit your ways to the Lord. Commit your ways to the Lord. In verse 5, And trust in him, and he will do this. He's going to make us righteous. He's going to reward us. He's going to reward his righteous reward. Shine will like the dawn. Your vindication will be like the noonday sun. Those are some promises. As we walk this thing called life with the Lord's hand and our hand and by our side, that those promises are going to come to us. You keep on walking. See, what are you saying? I'm saying, hang in there, man. Wait on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. That's what I'm saying. Do not be uh, afraid to share your story, your hurts, your 
times of trial in your life with those who are wanting to hear it. Don't be afraid. Listen, folks, we have not, we were not, we were, we were not designed to worry. And we have not been designed to fear. Why? Because the Lord, our God, is on our side. You are a child of the Most High God. We're not designed to worry, and we're not designed to fear. Somebody say amen. amen. Are you getting this today? I, when, I talk, when I talk to people about sharing their faith, they say, I don't know what to say, and I don't know how to say it. Share your story. Share your story. You know what? Nobody can, nobody can come up against your story. Why? Because it's yours. Well, that didn't happen. I'm telling you, it happened. They can't refute that. And when you share the story, when you share the burdens and the, and the trials and all that stuff that you have been through before you were a Christian, God is going to use that story and use those instances in your life that you have been challenged with to bless that person who you're talking to. And let me tell you what, I said this in, in our Sunday school class today. We are not responsible, but if it happens, it's good. We are not, you know, we share a story, and man, we hope that we bring someone to Jesus Christ right then and there. But our responsibility is to plant the seed, Amen. Our responsibility is to plant the seed. And somebody else in another conversation will make that seed grow. Wow. I, when I share the love of Christ with people, man, I want them to come to Christ right then and there. Not that I'm a browbeater of the Bible. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but... I just, I just get a sense from the Holy Spirit that says, okay, Steve, shut your mouth. It's done and over with. And I'll do the rest. <sighs> okay, God, got it. It's all good. But we, gotta be, we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice, don't we? We've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. And let me tell you, how, let me tell you what, folks. We can really get down on how we have lived our life prior to Jesus Christ. Man, if I could have another three hours, I could probably get you a good idea of what I've been through. Anybody up for that? <laughs> but you know what? He uses our story. He uses our story. And it's not how you start out in the Christian life. It's what? It's how you finish. It's how you finish. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had finished strong. And guess what? You can finish strong too. Why? It's not your ill health that defines you. It's not your challenges or problems in life that defines you. It's not your past that defines you. It's not your lack that doesn't define you. It's not your cars, your home, your job that defines you. Who defines you? It's the Lord God himself. He defines you. You are a child of the Most High God. Woohoo! Oh, let me try that again. You are a child of the Most High God. Woohoo! Amen? Yes! You have all of heaven behind you. And you got to keep on going like you got all of heaven behind you. Because you are high stepping it, my friends. I'm a child of the Most High God. Mm. Amen. Man of living. But you know what? Just like every other person, we like things at our fingertips. When we pray, we want things to happen like now. 
We expect answers to be immediate, so we are often impatient. But God requires us to wait on his timing, as Isaiah 55, 9 tells us. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. You hang in there. We got to hold on to the promises of God. Whew. And let me tell you what. <laughs> you love this. When we wait on God for answer to prayer, it's way better. It's way better than what we have ever expected. Woo! I, can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Oh, man. And I tell you what, God is going to bless your life. I'm not a person who likes to wait. My wife can tell you that. I don't like waiting. It drives me nuts. I, in, my, in, my, in my prayer room, I, I wore out our new carpet already because I'm pacing back and forth. <laughs> Come on, God, tell me. Oh, man. David, in his reflections, concluded that a life lived near to the Lord was the antidote to all troubles. We are encouraged by what we can learn from David's examples to have a closer walk and a total trust and confidence in God. We can trust the Lord for salvation. Oh, the banners are high when we come to the Lord. The banners are high. Woo! I just became a Christian. But when we are challenged, the banners start to lower. And our armor starts to tarnish. And even maybe possibly throw it down and walk away, just like our two examples earlier. But it is when we start to go through the fires of life that God starts working. Often we don't trust him enough in our daily lives, our families, our health, our troubles. We let our swords down, and we say, oh, woe is me, sits on the, in, in our sword, the God's word sits on the stand, and, you know, it's very seldom pick up, and then we put it on the shelf, and it starts to collect dust. The enemy's arrows start to fly in. The arrows of doubt and fear and resentment starts piercing. The bad thing about that is, is we start to believe it. In the worst and challenging time of your life, the enemy puts in your hand, head. Here's that question again. Huh, look at that. It didn't work, did it? Where's your God now? See, I told you, this whole God thing doesn't work. In the worst and challenging times of life, he creeps in. That's what happened to the two preachers before. Their shield and the rest of their armor went down in the dirt and walked away. They probably felt as God had let them down and let them hanging out to dry, but they forgot about the promise, a promise in God's word that says, what? I will never leave you or forsake you. You guys got to remember that. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. In fact, in Deuteronomy 31.6, in full states, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. And you all know what them are. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. God has given us a story. We need to tell it, and we need to share it. At one point in my life, it, it was a very dark moment. It was back in high school, I think it was. And, oh, man, my grades weren't going good. My friendships were going south. And things just weren't working out. And I sat in my living room of my mother's house contemplating. Contemplating. It's like, I'm going to end it. I'm going to end it. So I went upstairs in my room, and I got three or four belts. And in our apartment complex is a grove of trees. It was about midnight. I crawled up that tree. I put those belts on a limb, put the other end around my neck, 
and I jumped off that limb. Let me tell you what. This is a true story. In the middle of the night of midnight, I felt the blood being cut off from my feet, and as it started going higher, it started, kept on going faster. It got up to my waist, and I knew when it got clear to my head, I was a goner. And boy, when it, when it starts, it starts out slow, but the higher it gets, the oxygen is depleted, and the higher it gets, the faster it goes. And all of a sudden, I saw a bright white light in the middle of the midnight. You can believe this or not. It's my story. And I turned to my right, and I seen someone. I believe it was Jesus, but I couldn't see his face because we couldn't see his face. But I had, saw his head going, nope. Guess what happened? That limb broke. <laughs> Woo! That limb broke. Maybe that limb broke for such a time as this. All glory to God. It's not, it's not yeah, Steve, the limb broke. No, thank you, Jesus, the limb broke. Yes, give the praise to, give the praise to him. After that, God got a hold of me. I picked up my sword, and I picked up my shield and the rest of my armor and put my hand in the King of kings and the Lord of lords' hand. And boy, that's why I'm sitting here today sharing his love and his mercy to you all today. It's as if God was saying to me, I'm here. I love you. Sorry for your pain, son, but I'm here with you all. I'll go through the fires with you. I'll climb those mountains with you and, and tread those valleys with you. Not now. Now, pick yourself up. Pick yourself up. Get back out there in, that, in this thing called life. That's what a saint of God does. That's what a warrior does. We don't give up. We keep on fighting strong at the Lord's side, and the Lord is on our side. We keep on keeping on. He's got a plan for you, and he's got a plan for you, and you got a plan. He's got a plan for all of us. He is calling us to share our story. He is calling us to share our story with our friends. He is calling us to share our story with our neighbors. He is calling, to share, he is calling us to share our story with the guy down the street. He is calling us to share the story with the drunk in the doggone bar. Amen. We got to share our story. We all do this, and I guarantee you, we will start to see a revival. Everybody in this room share their story of how God has brought them through. We will start to see a revival. You will start to see a revival in yourself. You will start to see a revival in this church. You will start to see a revival in the city. You will start to see a revival in the state. You will start to see a revival in the nation. Because you see what God has brought you through, and you're sharing it, and those people say, yep, man, I've been there and done that. Whew, I am so glad I met you because... The clock is ticking. We need to get busy, saints of God. Amen? When you came in this morning, you were handing an envelope. It says, battle orders. I'd like to, take you, I'd like to have you take that and open that envelope up. Look at this. <laughs> it's from our church. We've been called the active duty. Open that, open that letter up. It says, 1 September 24th. I think that's today. To the saint of God, due to the current moral condition of our nation, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is calling all saints of God to go out to your neighborhoods, to your city and state and nation to tell all you see of your Savior's love and forgiveness. Suit up with the full armor of God. Raise that sword, the word of God. Raise that shield of faith. That's the only two defensive pieces of weapon we got. 
Lost souls are counting on you. Your brothers and sisters are counting in the faith, are counting on you. Most of all, the, his majesty, the Lord God himself, is counting on you. And guess what? Believe it or not, they don't know it yet, but your friends are counting on you. Your family is counting on you. you yeah, everybody around you in your, in your circle is counting on you to share your story with the love of God, to have them come to the love of Christ. Why? Because nine times out of ten, they have gone through the same stuff that you went through. Whew. Mm. God be with you all, Jesus. Look at the verse. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't believe anything else. Attention all saints of God. Man your battle stations. Sound the alarm loud and long. To all men of every nation. We're, we're kicking down the gates of hell. Not stopping till they're level. For the sentence of, the, of destruction is on the forehead of the devil. Lift your hands in victory. This is our finest hour. For the sleeping giant called the church is rising up in power. Cry aloud. Spare not. This lion's got a roar. We have many have lost some battles. Oh, yeah, we lost some battles. But we will win this war. Somebody say Amen. We made it through the fire, and our faith in God is strong. We're revelation generation with fire in our bones. We're filled with the Holy Ghost, trusting in the Bible. Fasten your seatbelt, saints of God. This world is and will break forth in revival because of you. Sharing your story. That's the battle cry. That's the battle cry. Father God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, you have called us to battle. And we who love you will go forth in this battle. God, I'm asking that you use every single solitary person in this place to further your kingdom. God, I've, and I am, am calling out the enemy of our souls, that he will not win. I'm calling out the enemy of our souls to get out of our minds, to get out of our heads, get out of our life, get out of every aspect of our life so we can march forward with the word of God and our shield up that we can bring people to you. God, I pray for a divine appointment for each and every person in here. Let us be ready for the answer, to give an answer for the hope that is in us. God, and you will bless each and every appointment that you are going to set up. Give us the, give us the courage Give us the boldness to do your bidding this day, this week, this month, and throughout the years until you call us home or until you come and get us. And we're going to give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Worship team. Okay, let's all stand together as we sing this song of dedication. And if you're ready to give your life to Christ, there's someone here, the baptism's ready. So if, you're, if your heart's being tugged, there's someone here who can talk to you this morning. But let's turn our eyes upon Jesus, the author and protector of our faith. Oh
One final song this morning before we go, and it's Oh, I Love Jesus, so let's all sing together as we go out and praise the Lord this week. Oh, how I love Jesus.